Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Seeking Excellence podcast. So for today's episode, I'm very excited to have one of my good friends, Dr. Alan Hunt, join me for an episode. And so Dr. Alan Hunt, author of Confessions of a Megachurch Pastor, author of Nine Words, author of uh, another great book on relationships that I can't remember the name of right now, but awesome dude. He works as a senior advisor at the Dynamic Catholic Institute and uh, has a great conversion story. He used to be a mega pastor in a uh, Methodist church in the South and now is a Catholic rock star. And so I'm very excited to have him join me this morning. Um, and we're going to be talking about, yeah, just kind of going through conversations with Protestants and some stuff that you know, we think that everybody kind of needs to emphasize and learn and uh, ways that we can grow and, and, and ultimately achieve the goal that Jesus laid out for us clear, clearly in scripture that he wants us all to be unified. So I really hope you enjoy our conversation. <laughs> he is a great time. He loves cutting up. He loves to roast people, which is one of my favorite things about him. So really excited to have Alan on the show this morning. Definitely. But first, if you would just Give us a brief introduction. Now, I've read somewhere that you were once a heretic and, and then redeemed your life. So we just talked through some of the journey of, of, of your conversion. I, I've always been, I think I told you this when we first met, Confessions of a Megachurch Pastor was one of my favorite dynamic Catholic books, um, especially before I met you. But, you know, even after meeting you, it was still one of my favorites. And I just loved that. I mean, that was one of the ones I ordered in bulk and passed out to a lot of friends and especially Protestant friends who had a lot of questions, you know, or just kind of wanted to experience things. Cause there's just a specific, I think, perspective that comes from being like deep in the Protestant, any, any Protestant church. And then that journey to Catholicism that a lot of Catholics, cradle Catholics, I think struggle to, to express clearly, you know? Yeah. I mean, of all the books that my wife has written, that I put my name on. Um, I think that's, I think that's some of our best work. <laughs> that's probably why you liked it. Yeah. That's probably why you liked it. Yeah. yeah. She's uh, the rock star of the family. Yeah. She, she's the, the brain and the bronze and well, yeah, here I am. Um, and I'm, and I'm the podcaster. There you go. That's the, that's the deal. Breaking into uh, the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the book was, um, I, I, I guess, Obviously, you know, I, I was the, my, my parents worked at a Methodist college. My uncle was a Methodist pastor. My grandfather was a Methodist pastor. My great grandfather was a Methodist pastor. My great great grandfather was a Methodist pastor. My great 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 grandfather was a Methodist pastor. So I kind of grew up Methodist, you know? Right. And I, I, told, I went I, to I, Methodist preschool. I don't know if I ever told you. Oh, that. did you really? Uh, I did. Yeah. I, I thought I saw, I recognized that light in your eyes. That's Baptized right. Lutheran went to Methodist, Methodist preschool. Lutheran. Yeah. So that's what that's what that's where it kicked in right that's there. Right. <laughs> uh, those Harrisburg Methodists. They, they, that's, <laughs> that's where the strongest you know. in, in Fuego, and so <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I took a little sojourn in the wilderness for about ten years in high school, college, and beyond, like a lot of folks. And then um, really, I was in business in, in consulting and uh, felt God's call in my life. And really, the only thing that I knew to do with that was to become a Methodist pastor because. That's all really I knew. Sure. And so I did that for 20 years and I, and I loved it. And I had the you know, great privilege to serve at three different congregations as their pastor. Um, but along the way, began to really ask questions in my own spiritual journey on my relationship with, with Christ Jesus and also about what was, what was true and also um, a friendship with the Dominican priest that I talk about in that book. And so really, it, yeah. it wasn't like it was sort of one big grand moment or anything. There were lots of little things along the way, lots of little experiences and encounters and questions and um, revelations. And kind of, you know, I guess about 15 or 18 years into my um, pastorate, I really began to, to struggle um, in a very profound way. I'd, I'd always sort of had an attraction to Catholicism for a number of reasons, but um, in the last few years, it, it, I was really having a bit of a conscience of a crisis of conscience, and that uh, I've got an integrity issue here. I, I I don't really believe what I need to believe in order to be the pastor of, the, of this great group of people at this great church, uh, and so I need to do something about that. So, um, but the, you know, the, the book <clears throat> to me is um, it's a, obviously it's a special book because it's it's my own journey. But the, the book's really not about my journey to, so much as it is about six things that, that caused me to become Catholic. So to me, it's, a, it's, a, I, I think you're right. It's, it's a, it's an easy way to share the faith with somebody who perhaps comes from a, um, a different Christian background than Catholicism. 
and to help them understand how we view a lot of things. Um, so it's not an apologetics book, you know, it's not a head cerebral intellectual book, um, but it's not just, hey, here's all about me. It, it, I, mean, I think it's, my, my wife actually did come up with the idea of the, of the six rooms of the house. Really? And, um, and I, I think she was brilliant in, in that insight in terms of just trying to show the beauty and the, the genius of Catholicism. So glad, glad you dig it. It's, you know, it's been a great journey. It's been fun. Had some bumps and bruises, but it's, uh, it's been all good. Yeah, no, big fan, big fan. And I think, uh, I think you're exactly right the way that you describe it and that it's not, uh, I wouldn't say overly theological. I don't know if it could be too theological, but it's not, yeah, just too intellectual. You know, it's a very simple way of expressing it. But one of my favorite quotes uh, from Fulton Sheen was, you know, he said, there's only 10 people in the world who disagree with the Catholic Church. The rest of the people disagree with what they believe the Catholic Church teaches. And that's so often been my experience um, when, when speaking with Protestants and asking them, you know, what do you know about Catholicism? And there's obviously a, a lot of Protestants out there who know a lot about Catholicism, but there's a lot who know nothing, you know, which is always very surprising to me. But you mentioned the truth. And I think that that was something that is at the heart of your journey, you know, is when you start to think like, what is actually the truth? And that's, that's something that I want to talk about today. But what I think one thing that's really interesting in the story that I want you to talk about a little bit, if you would, is the you talk about going to like the conferences where people would vote on how like certain congregations or churches would would be believing that that year on different topics. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, as you know, there's thousands and, and, and people have different estimates, but there's you know, the last time I looked, and this was a long time ago, there were 33,000 different kinds mm -hmm. of strains of Protestant Christianity in America. And so Protestant groups are organized differently. I mean, they, they really are. It's a very eclectic bunch. And so that's one of the things that's funny to me in, in being Catholic is how, you know, we always talk about Protestant. Um, like it's one group. Sort of this one group of people <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You know and, and Protest, Protestants themselves don't even they don't they don't even use the word Protestant they don't even know what are you talking about man I'm Baptist or I'm not right. a nomination or whatever. I don't know what Protestant means <clears throat> and, but it, as it's a almost Methodist, like if we said you know American and then the rest of the world <laughs> yeah exactly yeah we do yeah, it's like when if you uh, yeah, I think American or not American and, Central and Latin America, you talk about, well, I'm from America, and they go, well, you know, we live in America. I was like, oh, no, I mean, I'm from the United States. Oh, okay, yeah. Because <laughs> right. we, we, we have a very America-centric worldview. Exactly. Um, as Methodists, every, the, one, I think one of the great things that I found most frustrating about being a United Methodist was, it re, and this sounds like I'm making fun of it, it's not. It, it, uh, it's, made, it's, it's organized like the federal government. And so you, you have a Congress, it, it's called a general conference. You have a executive branch, which is the bishops. Um, and, the, and the bishops are elected. They're not appointed by anybody. They're elect, popularly elected. Um, and then you have the judicial branch. So instead of the Supreme Court, you have the judicial council. And so it makes it very difficult, just like it is in the U.S., it's very difficult. I mean, the, the federal government is set up in a genius way. It keeps, the, it keeps the U.S. from making big swings in any direction. It kind of keeps us fairly stable. Um, and doesn't allow for a lot of change, which a lot of people find very frustrating, but right. in some ways it helps kind of keep the country from blowing up. <laughs> which is good. It's sort of the same way. It, it, it's, it, it, nothing really is going to change about the Methodist Church. It just kind of keeps sailing along as this big ship, and the ship gets a little smaller every year um, because mm. they've lost members every year since 1968. So what is that, 52 years in a row? Uh, so it's shrinking, but it's very, very difficult to do anything meaningful to, to, to shape that because they vote on everything um, and everything's popularly elected. And so the bishops mm -hmm. tend to be more like politicians in general, um, like the people running for president, the people running for Senate. Um, not really, you don't really get leaders, you get politicians. And then you, every, every year and on the, at the local level, we would vote on a number of things. And then every four years, the, the governing body or the decisive body for the Methodists is called the General Conference, it's like Congress. And, and almost everything, not, not everything, but almost everything was up for a vote every four years. So wow. every four years we would vote on what we believed about life, what we believed about marriage, what we believed about um, abortion, what we believed about ordination, all, all these kinds of things. And so it was really not, not a particularly fun way to lead because if you, if you held convictions and beliefs that you felt like really weren't um, up for a vote, every four years you have to go out there and defend this and, and, and raise money to, to, to lobby. And I mean, it is like being in Washington. 
Wow. Um, yeah. And so we were always, we were always blowing in the wind. And so to me, it was deep. Catholicism was deeply attractive because you got the catechism um, and you got the magisterium and the catechism pretty well states who we are and what we believe. And that's, that's who we are and what we believe. Now, do people argue about that? Sure. But are we voting on that and changing the catechism every, every year or every four years? No. I mean, you got a lot of opinions about some different parts of the catechism, but uh, right. the, the truth, we, we say, yeah, this is who we are, whether it's politically expedient or not. And my experience yeah. in, in most of, mostly as a Methodist pastor and really as a Protestant in general, was it was more about the, the image I use is oftentimes we were more concerned trying to be relevant than we were about being holy. Mm, um, wow. and, you could, and I guess you could almost flip the other way for the, the criticism of Catholicism, I guess, is we were so concerned about being holy um, <laughs> that we're, we ignore trying to be relevant. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it, that's just one guy's observation uh, on a Friday morning. <laughs> right. Amen. Amen. In the middle of nowhere in Georgia, right? Yeah, exactly. In <laughs> County. That's great. I love it. No, I think that's really good. I think it's a really good point. And, and I think, you know, one thing that kind of makes me think about it is I had a conversation with one of my army chaplains uh, in my in the last last battalion that I was in before I got out. And he was a Lutheran chaplain in the army. And I just asked him one day, it kind of like hit me. We, we talked a lot about, you know, different denominations and things. And one thing that he said that really stuck out to me was he said that, uh, you know, if the army does it the same way that the church does, where, or the, we, that we often do, where we say, okay, you have Catholic, uh, uh, you have Catholic chaplains and you have Protestant chaplains. Like, and then yep. within the Protestant chaplains, you have the different denominations, but there's like, when you look at the church services on Sunday, there's yep. Catholic, there's Protestant, there's Muslim, there's Jewish, yep. you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Just kind of grouped together. And one yep. thing that he told me is he was always like, He's like, dude, I felt more, he's like, I'd rather be with the Catholics than be with some of the, you know what I mean? He's like, do you know how crazy yeah. it is with some of the stuff I get looped into with yeah. like this big grouping of people? I can't imagine how hard it must be. But I think, you know, one thing that I kind of asked him about, you know, being a Lutheran, and I'd love to hear you kind of talk about, is I asked him, I said, I said, hey, man, like, what do you think if Martin Luther came back today and he went to like an elevation church or, you know, Hillsong, like one of these like big mega churches, you know, I'm like, what would... What do you think he would think? You know, like the original Protestant, right? Like the, the guy who, who kicked it all off, like started the whole thing. Like, what do you think? Um, and and I, f I forget, it's John Wesley, right? Was the founder of the mm -hmm. Methodist Church. Yeah. And so like, right. what do you think those guys like coming back today to see like where, um, you know, many, many of the strands of Protestant Christianity have gone to, what do you think would be their, their reaction? Uh, that's a big question, dude. That's funny. Nobody's ever asked me that. I, yeah, really? Yeah. I, I used to when I, uh, that's the kind of Harrisburg intelligence you get on this podcast, though. That's uh, right. That, baby. Is, that insight. Five that star insight. question. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like club med. <laughs> right Benedict in college level. You know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny because I, I used to talk about this. I don't, I don't do this anymore, but I used to have as a, whenever people would ask me to come and kind of share my conversion journey. And I really, I mean, now that I've been Catholic 12 years, I, I, I don't really share that much anymore. But um, in, in the early days, I used to talk, I used to talk about your exact point, And that was, um, you know, if, and I didn't talk about Luther or Wesley, but it, but if you if you brought a fourth century Catholic or fourth century Christian who almost by definition would have been Catholic, um, and, and you brought him or her as a visitor with you to your average Protestant congregation or megachurch, they'd go with you and they'd say, "Hey, that's really good music," and that was a really good, really good message. Uh, when's church? Right. <laughs> where's church you know because that i mean that was great but where's church um right. because it, i mean and again it's it's a little unfair to luther and wesley because i mean luther luther didn't intend to do anything separate from catholicism i mean he just um he, he was right on a number of things and was trying sure, to kind yeah. of call the church to to be the best version of itself and it kind of spun out of control from there so i i don't think he ever envisioned in any way shape or form that it would have spun out to what i mean because he was an ordained catholic priest i mean at, at the outset and then, right. and then things like that usually do take on a life of their own. And I'm sure he was sitting there going, whoa, 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 trying to find the breaks. And it was too late. Yeah. You know? it, it, he, um, I mean, in the, my chaplain, like he, he even documented like, uh, you know, examples of when Luther did that and said, stop breaking stained glass, yeah. like stop doing, like destroying statues. Like I didn't, I didn't call for all that, you know? Yeah. You know, and, and, and you, you think about like the perpetual virginity of Mary, um, 
Luther w- would never have questioned that. And now it's like, you know, with, with any Protestant group, you talk about anything around Mary and all of a sudden the, the hackles go up. I mean, Luther had this very deep Marian devotion. So I mean, there was a lot of stuff that got, got thrown out with the, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater along the way. Um, but, you know, I mean, Luther, Luther was, Luther was Catholic. And so for him, it would be a very different experience than for John Wesley, who lived a couple hundred years after Luther, who grew up in the Church of England. You know, so he was sort mm. of an, an heir of King Henry and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, yeah, Luke, I mean, Wesley loved Catholicism and he hated Catholicism. Um, he loved the, uh, the tradition and the, and the sacramental Eucharist, Eucharistic centrality of it, but he hated Rome. He hated the, the hierarchy. He hated the, what he would call the popishness. Um, so interesting. Th- these guys would have, they'd all have very different perspectives, but they would all, they would all come back and go, where's church? I think they would say where's church because right. they, they, because there's no, there's, there's no, I mean, <clears throat> Very little sac in, in most most Protestant churches. There's there's not even a notion of sacraments, and that's the reason why you had the affinity with the Lutheran pastors. You know they're very sacramental, um, and Methodists are relatively sacramental. But a lot of Protestantism, they don't even understand or, or, or claim a category of sacrament. You know, is we do the we do the Lord's Supper. Um, Jesus isn't present in any way that he would wouldn't be present any other time. We're just remembering because he told us to remember what he did, uh, and we baptize people, but it has a different to it. Those are just things that, those are things that we're supposed to do. There's no, the, the sacramental mysteries that you and I take for granted, the, they, they, they see that completely differently. And so that would be very alien to, um, to Martin Luther and to some degree to John Wesley. Right. Yeah. I think it's so interesting. And I think, you know, like after having that conversation with him, I'm like, man, I would have never guessed. I think Martin Luther just climbed up on my list of, you know, people say like, who are five people from history you want to go back and have lunch with, you know, if you could have lunch with anybody. And I would love to just talk to him about, you know, what has all happened since then. And if, if he had, even towards the end of his life, after he saw how much the schism really rocked, if he wished he had approached it from a different way, you know, because I think it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point, Nathan, because you think about if you had to name five, perhaps the five most influential people in history, it'd be pretty hard not to have him on the list. Right. Um, yeah. You think That's about the, pretty in, huge the impact, yeah. the impact that that has had on world history ever since um, in every region of the world. Um, and some of the things that Protestants do so much better than we Catholics do. Um, right. And some of the impact, <clears throat> some of the impact of that. I mean, I saw a guy had a great, um, business school study, I don't know, 10 years ago. It was fascinating. Um, and, and I didn't dig into it. So how accurate it is, I don't know, but he tried to kind of map <laughs> out the areas, the areas of the world where there's been the greatest growth in, uh, in economics and economic development, what have you. And he showed that in, in a lot of those, it was, it was the Protestant groups because of the Protestant, what, you know, the, the old joke about the Protestant work ethic and all that kind of stuff that that really has created huge waves of wealth and, and lifting people wow. out of poverty that um, in areas that were more um, Catholic has not happened as much. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, that somebody should really do a lot of research. You could, you could spend a lot of time in a couple of careers studying that kind of stuff, but right. you're right. At the end of the day, Luther pro act and how much of that he intended like 20%, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think one of the points you made there was really, really interesting is because that is the thing that you said about how if you brought a fourth century Christian to today's different church services, you know what I mean? Like, what would they think? I think what's so interesting about that is that I think a lot of like more non-denominational churches believe that that is what early Christianity was, you know, like to, to a certain, like their, their belief, or at least from people I've spoken to and from what I've seen and just kind of, if you just kind of watch it, it's, it's like this basic, like we, like Jesus didn't create religion, like in the beginning of, you know, Christianity, like, when Jesus was walking this earth, like he did not envision religion and they have this belief that like Jesus hated religion. And therefore, you know, like the, what Jesus wanted, what the early Christians, what the apostles did was X, Y, and Z, you know, but how do you feel like we kind of neglect what Jesus actually taught or, or people kind of neglect that we, uh, we don't hopefully, but how do you feel like people generally neglect what Jesus taught, especially in regards to the whole Jesus versus religion aspect? You know, another great, another great Harrisburg question. I'm getting good at this, huh? We should, we should have done this. If I knew in the inter- this interview was going to be so uh, 
high, high char highly charged intellectually. I would have done it later in the day when I was actually really awake. Uh, <laughs> you you understandably underestimated me. And yeah, I, I, I did. I did. Yeah. I, mean, I, I saw the tattoos. I went, yeah, 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 hard as it's going to be. So, uh, I, I, ask me the question again. I forgot. Oh, about the early Christians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Jesus versus religion. Yeah. You know, I think well, it's a, know, a common I, thing. I guess the, the 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 two things there for me, Nathan. One would be we all tend to look at history. Um, we we like to think of history as, as sort of being this one thing but we all read history through our own lens, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we all, right. it's amazing how much our own perspective now shapes what we notice about back then. And so uh, everything in Protestantism, every Protestant group has its own origins that are at least 1500 to 1900 years after the origins of the Catholic church. And so you have, for you and me, we go back and when we read early Christian history, we, A, we see it through a Catholic lens, and B, it was written by Catholics primarily, because that's all that there were, and we're reading the early church fathers who are all Catholic, um, because we feel a linkage to those guys, because right. we come out of that stream. Now, if, you're, if your church wasn't born until 1600, 1800, or 2019, or 2020, uh, you look at that very differently. Mm -hmm. um, you, you sort of skip over everything that happened between uh, the book of Acts and you as if that first century and that second century didn't matter. Um, and you also read the book of Acts very differently when you think about uh, the authority of Peter and the authority of the apostles and the fact that people were coming right. to them um, and, and what they were doing. You see that very, you tend to see it through the lens of the church that you're in now or the ecclesial community as Pope Benedict would call them, the, the, that you're in now. <laughs> And you, you, so you ignore all the history in between and you ignore right. the, the early stuff that teaches you and me not only about the authority of the church um, and, the, and the creation of bishops, I mean, early on first century, but also how central the Eucharist was from the very beginning. Um, you, if your church was born in 2020, you look back and you don't, even know, you don't even notice that. You just focus on, hey, there was some great preaching, you know, and they were reaching people with the gospel. Um, right. And to some degree, that's true. But all the early stuff shows us how central the Eucharist was. And that again, kind of got thrown out with the, with the bathwater. Right. What, one thing I used to always say, especially when I was talking to, to Protestants in, in the army, because you have a generally more patriotic group, you know, uh, generally more conservative sure. is I would say, you know, how, what a lot of people do uh, and what you would think is absurd is if somebody was an American citizen, right. And like a passionate American citizen, and they knew about all the events, you know, of the revolution, the Declaration of Independence, 1776 through, you know, the, um, you know, all, all the, the Bill of Rights, like everything kind of getting started before 1800. And then they skipped 1800 up until like the Obama years, you know, right. and like that was yeah. their understanding of American history. And like, that's what people do with church history. And I was like, yeah, I just don't understand. That's a great, that's a great point, man. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, you miss like the Civil War, World War I, World War II. Like there's some big stuff that happened. Yeah, there's a couple the... things that happened and it kind of matter, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So there was George Washington and then there was Trump. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't really care about anything in between. Well, okay. You might want to think about that. Um, yeah. Just something to consider. It, like, Should women be voting or not? You know? should black people be able to vote and go to public schools or not? And um, what about this, this Lincoln guy? Well, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's all about the constitution in Washington right. and then Trump. Like, it, it, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about, about, about that before. It's, that's a great way of looking at it though. Yeah. And that's only 200 years or 200 and whatever it is. Right. Years. That's 200 years, not, yeah. not 2000, you know, like, and then, so yeah. it's like, think about that and then multiply that by 10. And that is what you're essentially doing when all you care about is the Bible and yeah. then you just jump ahead. To everything else, my pastor, everything. my pastor here in my, right. in my little town, there was there was the Bible and him and everything in between doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Even when you think of like you know when you think of what you were saying at the beginning, where you're like my great 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 grandfather was a Methodist pastor, like thinking doesn't about matter. how how yep. low how small that was in the church history. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? it, like was, it, was, it wasn't even a pebble, man. It was like a crazy, little yeah. sand dropping into the ocean. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's so wild to think about. <laughs> it, it, it's just wild. I think how. We do this a lot, you know, we just make assumptions and we don't intentionally decide what we're going to believe or what we're going to do. We just kind of, people drift with the wind or, I mean, it's the same thing that I think a lot of 
Catholics get accused of is like you only believe that because that's what you were taught, you know. And it's like, well, what do you like? What are your reasons why you believe what you believe? Yeah, you know, exactly. like, have you really done extensive <laughs> research on all these different did the, things? Did, you the know? An, did the angel Maroni come down and give you some special thing? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the rest of us didn't get. You're working on straight revelation. Yeah, my yeah, bad. A, yeah, I didn't. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, know. didn't know sorry that's outstanding yeah good for you teach me more though because I'm, yeah, I'm, right. I'm all here baby <laughs> i'm trying to get all here too yeah i think it's so interesting and, and one thing i one thing that i think is i think i was going i had a, a little rant going with some of my friends when i was in colorado i was with one was a fallen away catholic and then three were protestants and one one of them has kind of been having like this journey getting closer and closer to you know uh, drifting away from some of the more, uh, you know, non-denominational churches that I feel like don't tackle some of the harder questions, the harder issues that we're facing in our lives, and uh, like pushing more and more towards orthodoxy, I think. And one of the things that I just, I shared with them, you know, is is about the Bible and like how, I'm like, the one, I think, the one like going back to this like assumptions thing, right, it blows my mind how, because we have the Bibles on our phones, you know, we have like this, like what some people call like the curse of knowledge, right? Like we can't imagine what it was like before that. And I'm like, it's easy now that you have your Bible in your pocket to say, oh, the Bible is all that matters, you know, because you can have it with you all the time. There's 89,000 translations of it. There's the New Living Translation that makes it like sound so a, a two-year-old could understand it. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, what, the, what was life like before the printing press? What was life like for Christians, you know, before the Bible was created? Like the Bible, it's not like Jesus, like it's almost as if there's like this assumption that Jesus after the resurrection, before he ascended into heaven, was like, here, let me, let me yeah, put this together. Manual, go. Yeah. Right, yeah. You know, yeah. St. Paul's yeah. going to write these letters. Some people are going to write these ones. Don't include those, you know, like I got this, like this is the table of contents. And you know what I mean? Like, let's get to work. And then he didn't leave until he blessed off on all of it. And then was like, Oh, and by the way, like in 2000 years when they translated, it, you know, 45,000 different ways, it's, it's yeah. all going to be good. It's all going to be yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. people can interpret it on their own. You know, like, yeah, I feel and, and, and it, this can, and, and I'm embarrassed to say, Nathan, I didn't really ever, I mean, this is the kind of stuff I started to kind of wrestle with because, right. um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I spent a lot of time studying scripture, you know, and devoted a lot of my life to that. And I love scripture. Um, but I started, started thinking about stuff and I was like, you know, we didn't really have scripture till the fourth century. Um, we had the, we had the writings, but nobody, but it wasn't until, and they were all written by Catholics, by the way. Um, but it wasn't until the church decided these books are in and these books are out um, toward the end of the fourth, fourth century that you actually even had a Bible. Mm. Um, and then, I mean, there's the reason that we have such great, beautiful stained glass and, and, and art and statuary all over the world, and in particular in Western Europe, because most people couldn't read. And you, it wasn't like you had a printing press where everybody had, you know, first of all, you couldn't go to school. Right. Um, that was a luxury. And second of all, you didn't, have, you didn't have a copy of the Bible, even if you wanted it. And so they, they created the and stained glass so, couldn't that, read. <laughs> so that you and I, who couldn't read, could see yeah. the pictures um, and understand the stories. Uh, and so it wasn't, right. you're right. The, I mean, the printing press doesn't get anywhere near enough credit either. It was like, you're talking about Martin Luther and the printing press at the same period in history. Boom. Yeah. I mean, two of the most significant things in world history. Nobody ever talks about either one of them. And so you got, again, you got those 1500 years. Did those 1500 years between Jesus and the printing press and Martin Luther matter? Well, well yeah, you and I say, yeah, they, they kind of do, you know, right. um, Abe Lincoln matters, civil war matters, reconstruction matters, Andrew Jackson, those things matter. Yeah. Um, and th there's a reason why we are where we are. And so, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great point. So for the first three to 400 years, it was all about the oral telling of the stories and the, and the, and the, and the church having its structure and the bishop trying to kind of um, administer stuff and all that's just totally forgotten. It's like, the, you're right. It's like Jesus, right before he ascended, said, here's the owner manual. Here's everything. Yeah. I wrote it all. And, and even that belief, like, so this one, this one always trips me up because I just, <clears throat> I really struggle being like, patient and empathetic and compassionate while while like listening to it because i just i view it and i've, I've heard it stated you know similar to like the relativism argument where it's like it's self-defeating you know in that like when people argue relativism like yep. it's self-defeating like the one sentence that rebuts it is yeah. if, if there's no universal truth that is universal truth you're saying that that's right. true for everybody right exactly. that there's no universal yeah. truth so you can't say that because it defeats itself yeah. similarly if all we need is scripture 
then then scripture should say that, you know, right. like it would exactly. have to be a teaching. It doesn't even claim it for itself. Exactly. Like, in the Bible, there has to be at least one verse that says, yeah. this is all you need. This book, like yeah. at the end, like yeah. John, St. John should wrapped it up with like, yeah. you know, this is it. Like all you need is this book, but it never says that. So it's like, where yeah. does that teaching come from? Yeah. You know, like there, there's no, I, that's what, that's what like blows. And it's, it is one of the most <laughs> deeply held beliefs. You know, when I, when I have debates or yeah. arguments with it's Protestants, critical. It yeah. is one of the most deeply held beliefs that like show me that in scripture. Well, well I'm, I mean, I'm happy to, but who says that I have to, I mean, that, why, why do you need me to prove it out of scripture? Cause where did you get that idea? I mean, exactly. And, right. and, and, and frankly, I'd never really had that. I mean, this is embarrassing. I mean, cause you know, I, I left the business world. I'd gone to seminary at Emory university. I got a PhD at, at Yale in new Testament, and ancient Christian history. And I, and I was, I was actually really wrestling with this idea. I was trying to figure out, the authority of scripture in my life. And, I, and I'm working on this PhD and I'm talking to one of my professors up at Yale, um, brilliant guy, Church of Christ, which is all scripture all the time anyway. Mm. And he's a Church of Christ guy. Um, and I said, you know, I really want to focus on what St. Paul understood about the authority of what he was writing when he wrote it. Uh, how, did he, how did he see that? Um, and and, I, and I, because I believe that, you know, scripture is authoritative and everything is authoritative. And I want to see if St. Paul believed that. And you know, I go to that Second Timothy verse about all Scripture is uh, is useful, is inspired, and, and useful in, in instruction of the Lord. And he says, "Yeah, but it doesn't say that it's authoritative. It says it's inspired, mm. but it doesn't say that it's a little only. It doesn't say it's the only authority. It doesn't even say it is authority. It just says it's inspired." And I went, right. "Oh, dude, you know, you're you're right." And that was the verse that we all that was our go-to verse. And I was like, "That, that verse doesn't even say that." Um, so <laughs> right. you're right. I mean, but but most of us. 98% of us, particularly as Americans, you know, we're all individuals and we're all unique and we're all special and we all got our own thoughts that, that are true for us. Um, we, we never really take time to think about what we believe and why. And I think that's part of the reason why Catholicism is, is um, unpopular because we do accept that the church has authority and we do accept that the church has something to teach me, not just that I have something to teach the church. The church has something to teach me um, right. because the church has been thinking about this a long time. Um, and so if I have the humility to subordinate myself and say, you know what, I may not know everything, right. I, I'm going to listen to what the church has to say. And actually, and that, that's part of what ultimately led me to become Catholic was I realized every time I really wondered about something the church was trying to teach me and I really reflected, I was like, no, you know what, the I think the church is right. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than my, my view beforehand was always, I'm the authority. Um, I got the church, a few things to teach the church. And all of a sudden I realized, no, no, no the church is the authority. Right. Um, and I need to subject myself to that truth with humility. And that's, that's not easy to do, particularly as an American. Yeah. Who gets the benefit of the doubt in your research? Yep. You know, I think it's something that's so interesting because I've even had a lot of, you know, a lot of Protestant friends who move around, especially in the army. Right. And they get moved around to different places. And be like, oh, we really didn't like this pastor or they're going to a church. My dad did this. You know, they're going, he's going to a church and then the pastor starts getting kind of wonky and saying stuff that he doesn't agree with. So then he leaves. Yep. And he's got to find another church. And it's like, so you, at that point, at that point, when you're church shopping as a Protestant, you are like, when I'm church shopping as a Catholic, I want to see who's upholding the, the teachings, like you said earlier in the catechism, you know, that I know as a well-formed Catholic, like who's upholding those? Like, that's the only, like, I just don't want anybody who's violating those in any major way, you know, and I have my rule book, but it's like, when you are, when you're Protestant, you're church shopping, like you become the authority, like it's your interpretation of the Bible Precise. that now is how yep. you're grading every single one of the pastors that you're going around and how you're grading the churches, you know, which is yeah. really, really interesting. Um, I know you got to get going soon. I want to ask you one yep. last question that I think is, is, is so interesting that I get, and I think can sometimes be kind of hard to explain. I'd love to hear your perspective on is like when th there's a, there's such a tough kind of dichotomy or balance when you have somebody that's in your family who let's say is a fallen away Catholic and now they're a practicing Protestant, right? Going to a non-denominational church. What is, what is the, your perspective on, like, it's like, well, it's better than nothing. And I would agree with, personally that it is better than nothing, right? But what is kind of your, your perspective on the need to be Catholic, the need to receive the sacraments and how all of that works into our salvation? Like whether or not somebody converts, um, you know, or somebody who is Catholic and leaves the church, like what is your perspective on, on how that impacts one's soul and salvation? You know, it was funny because I, I guess it was about, I don't know, three or four years after I became Catholic, um, Pope Benedict wrote on that <clears throat> in a way that was really helpful to me. And he said, you know, 
Um, it's not right to call Protestant congregations churches because they're not the church. They are ecclesial communities. And he said, um, and salvation is available in those um, Protestant communities. Um, and we're grateful for that. And we're, we're on the same mm -hmm. team. But what differentiates Catholicism as the church is um, two things that are interrelated. And one is the, the apostolic succession um, and therefore the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist that comes through that apostolic succession. Mm. And to me, that was a really helpful, simple way of understanding it is that the two things that the that Protestant communities are missing are those two things, that apostolic succession through, the, through um, Peter and the apostles and now to the bishops uh, and on through the hands of the priests, um, and therefore the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So for me, um, obviously, A, given that I live in rural Georgia, and B, given that um, I have spent 44 years as, as a Methodist um, and um, have, have an enormous community of Protestant friends or acquaintances and what have you, and I live in an area that's predominantly Baptist, Right. I have a deep appreciation. I have a deep appreciation for them and for their faith. Um, but I think back to your earlier point about Martin Luther and what have you, I think, you know, we have, it doesn't do any good for you and me to go back to the first century or the 14th century. I mean, we live in the 21st century. Um, and so we live post Martin Luther. This is the, this is the state of the union and the world and the church as we know it. So I, I accept that, but I do think that slowly, but, and this is just Alan, um, slowly but surely God is at work um, bringing us all back to union into the, into the mm -hmm. church, into the one Holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, does that mean people who aren't Catholic aren't saved? Of course not. Um, but it does mean that God's heart is for unity. God's heart is not for fractiousness, contentiousness, and brokenness. Um, there is one church. It's God's church. And uh, he is at work, whether I'll see it in my lifetime, whether you'll see it in your lifetime, I have no idea. But, that God is at work, just as Jesus said in John 17, that, you know, I pray that my people will not only be one, but would be perfectly one. Um, and the image he uses is not spiritually, it's, it's, it's of a body, it's of a physical body. And so I do think God is at work doing that. We don't necessarily always understand or see how. Um, but as the church goes through a lot of trials and tribulations right now, particularly in the Western world, where we're um, on the decline and, and oftentimes being um, hostily opposed, uh, I think that's going to pretty clearly and pretty quickly cause people to come together on what do we actually, what really do we believe? Because we need to stand together rather than standing apart. And I think that some of the old debates between Protestants and Catholics are going to fade away pretty quickly in that. Right. That's awesome. My first big takeaway from that was 44 years as a Methodist, 12 years as a Catholic means you're getting kind of old. Um, so was... <laughs> it is, it is, it's, 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 it's not good, Nathan. It's not good. So if I were you, I wouldn't do that. I would, I would not do that. Just avoid, yeah, avoid old age. Uh, <laughs> with, all the hair, with all that hair you got, you're so far so good for you. I hope, yeah. hope it works out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know, I know. I, it's, like I caused... old, like, it's like the old comedian who said, my, my plan is to live forever. So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know I caused you a lot of pain back in January when I cut my hair short. And so I, I vowed essentially to never do that again um, at that point. But the other, the other good thing. I need you to be away. like Samson. I need you to be like Samson. Don't there cut you go. Hair, man. Never weak, again. Weaker weaker. <laughs> the other great thing though, is that, you know, you're, you're, I think we both hopefully through this conversation and people that are listening, people that are listening is the need for us to be, you know, out in the world, but not of the world, you know? And that, that being true, I think we have to break down the fear that a lot of Catholics have of having Protestant friends and Protestant family members. You know, it's like, there has to be this like huge divide, almost like you can catch it, right? Like you can catch <laughs> being anti-Catholic. It's like, it's not COVID-19, you know? Like you don't have to <laughs> distance yourself from, from Protestants. There's a lot of good things. I've learned a lot of great stuff from, from Protestants over the years that have helped me in my speaking, in my writing, in my life, you know, in my own prayer life in my setting of scripture. And so I think that, I hope that people really take that away, you know, as much as we, you know, might laugh or get excited or not understand uh, certain beliefs of, of other people. There's, so, there's such an importance and such a value in being willing to be close to them because that's the only way that you can answer those questions and that you can really start to address the miseducation that a lot of people have about the Catholic churches if you're out and among them, because if you're not 
and if you're not living by a good example, right? Like, cause if you're, if you're a Protestant and you're happy and you're highly engaged in your love in your life, you know, and you're joyful and you have the fruits of the Holy spirit and you see some miserable <laughs> Catholic, yeah, you know, yeah. who's not, who's not experiencing any of those things, the joy of Christ, like, why would anybody want to ask you the questions? You know? So that's what I think is so important is that we have to like Catholics, I think very often will focus on the truth and we kind of neglect the beauty and goodness aspect, you know, and the beauty that comes through obviously God's creation, but also like personal holiness and then the goodness aspect of like having a good heart, you know, being lighthearted. Um, I mean, that was one of the things that, that I really appreciate about Pope Francis is that I think as Catholics, mm -hmm. I don't know how long it's been, whether it's been over the last 20 years or 50 years. Um, I think we have focused on being right. Um, yeah. And, you know, as, as Aquinas says, it's more important to love God than to know God. Um, and, and as Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Wouldn't be right. Know all the answers. Um, know the truth. It, it, love, it's more important to be loving than right. Um, and St. Paul even says it in First Corinthians, you know, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so God's heart is for us to be one. And, you know, it's more important for you and me to be loving people than it is to uh, make sure that we know every single answer to every um, question about the faith uh, or about, uh, about philosophy and metaphysics. Not that all that's not important. I mean, you and I are well-educated dudes, but the, at the end of the right. day, um, if it doesn't move from your head down to your heart, you're in trouble. Absolutely. And, and there's, there's a lot of people, I think, live on the extremes of either one of those. Yep. Or could, they could err on the yep. side of, you know, like yep. you're too focused. Yep. And I talk about that a lot. And I'm, and I'm like, you're very service, very love oriented, which is great. And now you got, but you need to learn some stuff, you know, yep. and those people who are all on the head that never really travels down to their heart. And I love, yep. especially in your CD where you talk about your conversion story. And I think you write about it in the book too, but I've listened to the CD more recently than I read the book. But when you were there with the, with the nuns, you know, with the cloister yeah. nuns and, and you got to see their beauty and, and just like who they are and like, just like Jesus being reflected on their faces, you know, is, is so, so cool. And there's nothing that can replace that. There's no amount of knowledge or studying exactly. that, exactly. that can create yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Just knowing stuff won't create it. So that is excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Alan Hunt. It Good has to been, see you, my friend. You are the best. <laughs> absolute pleasure. Joking and saying go Chiefs with you this morning. That's it. So thank you so much, man. We'll talk soon, Nathan. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, listening to this episode. I hope you really enjoyed listening to me and Alan go back and forth uh, talking about some of these things and, and the different beliefs between Protestants and Catholics and uh, just what we can learn from each other and the ways that we can grow in our holiness and grow closer to God and really spread the gospel throughout the world. And so I, I want to encourage you, if you have not yet, subscribe to our podcast leave us a rating. I know everybody says that. And so I feel like you should, I should say it too, like go on the Apple store and leave us a rating. I'll, I'll give you a quarter if you shoot me a DM and tell me you did it. And then go and subscribe to our newsletter. Our weekly newsletter is really awesome. We have great, great writers uh, who write for us uh, for our blog each week. And then we highlight videos and podcasts and different things that we're doing and, and events that we have coming up as well. So I don't want you to miss any of those. You can also learn more about Seeking Excellence at thosewhoseek.org those who seek.org you also find that in the show notes so thanks for coming out today leave us a, a comment or something on instagram let us know what you thought about the episode